afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to the lecture sponsored by the Institute of World Politics. For those of you who are new, IWP is a graduate school of national security, intelligence, and international affairs. We offer a doctoral program, seven master's degree programs, including two online MAs, and 18 certificates of graduate study. If you're interested in learning more about us, feel please feel free to speak to one of our staff at the conclusion of this event or visit iwp.edu. On behalf of IWP, I would like to thank all of our supporters who make IWP events possible. To support the mission of IWP, please visit iwp.edu forward slash donate. Today, we'll be hearing from IWP alumnus Robert Roseberry, who will deliver a lecture titled The United States in the Multipolar World. Robert Roseberry holds a Bachelor of Science in Strategic Intelligence, a Bachelor of Science in Criminal Psychology, and a Master's in Strategic Intelligence Studies from IWP. He has followed world events over the past year and how the globe is changing. Through his research, he believes he can give insight on how the United States can traverse these unknown waters. Robert currently lives in South Carolina and enjoys traveling and a good Irish whiskey. He is looking to join the United States Air Force this year. With that, please join me in welcoming Robert Roseberry. Thanks. I'd like to thank uh, IWP for letting me come lecture a third time because they liked me enough for the first two times. Um, an east wind is coming and it will be bitter and cold. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's phrase rang true when he wrote it and it seems applicable now. For some, the wind is still on the horizon and for others, it's already here. Our world is in chaotic change. The largest modern land war is still going on in Europe. The Middle East is on fire between the Houthis, the Iranians, the Israelis, Hamas. It's a mess. And now smaller blocks of nations are looking to figure out who they want to align with in the coming decades. This chaotic change hasn't hap or has happened before, and it probably will happen again. Most recently, I would say it happened in 1991 when the Soviet Union fell. The United States became the sole superpower of the world and the greatest superpower in the world history. It controlled large swaths of economics and sway over multiple nations. The Pax Americana or peace dividend that was brought afterwards kind of led to peace for, I would argue, at least 20 or so years. But now things have changed. And there's a new access trying to break the monopolarity of the United States, led by the Chinese, the Russians, and the Iranians. One doesn't have to be an analyst here in DC to know that, well, the United States is kind of losing its grip. That the general mood outside of the Beltway, if you go talk to people out there, it's, uncertain, it's uncertainty and worry, realistically, about the future. But it's not just here that things are bad. The other poles that I'll be talking about in a multipolar world are also suffering as well, mostly from population decline, as nobody realistically has an increasing population, all declining. The economic woes from both COVID and the aftermath of just the sheer shock to the global economic system that that caused, and just the uneasy feeling that, well, something's on the horizon. This, in turn, has led several poles to form outside the United States, and smaller blocks of nations will try to find shelter in these areas in the coming decades. The first poll I would like to talk about is the clicker. There we go. The first poll I'd like to talk about is, well, the United States. Though declined from where it was in 1991, it is still the most powerful nation on the earth. At its peak, the United States controlled 30% of the world economy. It had a robust industry sector, but that's been overtaken by the Chinese. Now, in 2019, the most recent data I saw, China actually makes up 30% of global manufacturing. So the United States has fallen from from grace a little bit and when it comes to actual industrial manufacturing. And when it comes to population, much like other nations, we're suffering the same. While our population has increased as a number, it's decreased of actual Americans. Mostly it's unfettered immigration that has kept the United States afloat population-wise. Uh, lastly, the key reason the United States has been able to be so powerful is its military and the ability to project power, ensure free commerce and trade over the seas, and keep the world at least aligned to what it believes it should be, it should be best doing. 
However, that's slipping now. The Houthis have shown that ragtag pirates can pretty much stop all shipping in the Red Sea. The Russians have shown that, well, maybe United States foreign capabilities aren't as much, aren't as grand as they always played out to be since they're still locked in a war in Ukraine. And China just kind of has gone unopposed, violating our airspace and whatnot with the infamous Chinese balloons. So as such, the military on that regard has declined to an extent. And another way it's declined is just because of the fact that recruiting is down. Two branches within last year actually made the recruitment goals. That was the Marine Corps and the Space Force. So the military is struggling when it comes to recruitment. We're struggling to keep the world order together. Our economy is kind of in a slump and our population is artificially inclined. But we are still at the end of the day, the top dog as it currently stands. But it's allowing smaller poles or more poles to form. The first of which would be the Europeans. Now as a whole, I'm gonna mention Europe, European Union. I'm lumping the British into this, even though I know they're not part of the European Union, but they're kind of lumped in with this. Um, realistically, the EU and Europe as a whole has more or less used the Pax Americana to just boost its own industry and its own economic outputs. They haven't really increased their military capabilities. And currently, they were really shocked when Russia first took over Crimea in 2014. That was a wake-up call that apparently fell on deaf ears because they really got a shock in 2022 when Russia invaded Ukraine. And as such, the Europeans are now squabbling amongst themselves to figure out which way they want their poll to go. I would say it's broken down essentially into three main sectors. First of which is nations that are very pro-EU, but want to have independence nominally from the United, Sp United States, such as France or Germany. Then you have nations on the other side who mostly wish to have less EU interference and a stronger relation with the United States, such as Poland, England, the Baltics, etc. And then you also have the third, more neutral parties who are kind of just going to go with whoever the flow is. Now, the reason I mentioned Europe as a moving up poll is Europe, at the end of the day, has the third largest economy in the world, obviously being led by the French, the Germans, and the English. And as such, they're able to conduct trade on a high level with varying nations, and they don't necessarily have the baggage of, well, you're trading with the United States. South America has recently increased its trade with the United or with the Europeans, and as a whole, the Europeans, though again split on this issue, are increasing trade somewhat with the Chinese. Now, the Europeans, when it comes to military strength, uh, look great on paper, but they don't really have a whole lot of teeth. Uh, it hasn't really been shown that their militaries are even up to snuff to worry about uh, or to be able to stop a Russian invasion without the United States there. And so as such, they're somewhat united militarily and on paper, like I said, they have a big military, but not one that has really been tested well. And then lastly, uh, as I mentioned, population decline, which uh, really needs to be taken into consideration. Uh, the Europeans... There's no country in Europe that has a positive population. All countries in Europe have negative populations right now, which means they're just not replacing at a high enough level. So it's really hard as the whole of the continent to kind of justify, hey, let's go to war, let's defend, let's spend more on our military when you barely have enough people to go to work. Now, Europe is obviously afraid of the next poll, one of which that I'm sure everybody here is more well aware of, and that's the Russian Federation. Now, the Russians are the clear antagonists to both the European poll and to the American poll. They have been an antagonist since at least 1945 when we broke up Europe. However, Russia's economy is on the war footing, so they don't really have a whole lot of industrial base outside of what's going towards their military. Their population is in such a decline that Vladimir Putin wants women to have six kids, three for him and three for her. So. There's those two complications on top of the fact that, well, the Western world doesn't want to trade with Russia. They've been probably one of the most sanctioned countries in the past, in the past decade. But this might lead some of you to think, why is Russia even up on here? You know, who's really going to move towards Russia? And Russia's strong suit is the fact that socially they're getting a lot of nations to align with them. Russia's main goal is seen as the bulwark against Western and hedonistic liberalism that's corrupting the youth and corrupting the West. And they see themselves as really the last known bastion of just 
European and or uh, Western values. Now, that might sound insane, but clearly their siren call hasn't really, you know, ha has really affected some places. Hungary, for example, is being much more pro-Russia ever since uh, Viktor Orban has been more aligned with him. Uh, Slovakia just recently uh, said that they're more willing to work with the Russians. And a large majority of conservative populist parties, both even in the United States and in Europe, are all more accepting of the conservative authoritarianism that Russia seems to be pushing. Now, Russia does have a, like I mentioned, an economy on the warpath, but they also have a lot of natural resources which other countries wish, wish to take. As such, you see nations like India trading a lot with Russia, even though technically they're kind of supposed to be on our side. And you also end up with Russia increasing its trade with China. Though limited, it has increased dramatically uh, over the past year when um, the, that's where the Russian economy moved. So Russia has some friends and is really kind of pushing itself as the defender of Western values, which to be completely honest, you know, when you look at the news here, it's not really that insane to think of. I looked up some news articles today. Front page story was that a woman stole two, uh, $2,500 worth of Stanley mugs. And that was a front page story from the BBC. You know, if, uh, as a foreigner looking at the United States, you're like, man, this guy's a little nutty. Like, you know, look, you know Russia's over here touting this stuff. The United States, eh, you know, you're concerned about a woman stealing mugs, you know. So... They have that sway in that regard as well. But as I mentioned, Russia has been buddying up with more neutral nations like, China, like India, but also more antagonistic nations towards us like China. That's who I'll be talking about next. The Chinese are a slumbering dragon, and they've been waiting for this moment for a long time. As Napoleon once said, you don't stop your enemy if you know they're going to be making a mistake. They possess the second largest economy in the world, the largest army by sheer numbers in the world, and they're slowly increasing their sphere of influence. Recently, they've just increased uh, the BRICS membership to India and a slew of Middle Eastern nations. They've recently been contacted by both Ukraine and um, I think it was uh, the Saudi Arabia to broker negotiations. So clearly a lot of nations are seeing China as maybe a counterbalance to the United States. Maybe not ideologically, but definitely on the same level power-wise. Now as of the time of writing this, China's economy is somewhere in the uh, unknown, realistically. I hear some people say that it's boosting and it's going great. I hear some people say it's going terrible and everything in between. Realistically, the Chinese economy is struggling, but it seems like they're trying to get a hold of that. Now, with their economy also comes with their military, which is also struggling to a degree. They militarily have just purged, as far as I understand, a large swath of their rocket forces after numerous accounts of corruption uh, sprang up. I read in one news story that they were using rocket fuel to make hot pot. Now, I like a good lunch as, next, as much as the next guy, but if you're using your military resources, maybe not so much. But China has one thing militarily that, well, nobody else does, and that's just manpower. And with that manpower comes a declining population. China right now as it sits, I think I read yesterday, that it sits right now at a negative birth rate, which means they're not even replenishing their population. So China has a lot of men that they kind of need to get a whole lot of rid of to you know, actually kind of equal out their population equation. And that makes them a more deadly pull realistically because they know that as time moves forward, those men will be less fighting capable. And if you have an excess amount of men, well, you have an excess amount of people to throw at a front line. Now that we've covered some of the polls here, you know, one might ask, well, how come people aren't just aligning with the United States anymore? And simply put, if it was the year 2000, they definitely would when the United States was number one. But things are different now. The United States across the globe is seen as unstable, and this instability is fueled by a multitude of factors, some of which I believe play a detrimental role to the United States' ability to conduct foreign affairs. First of which is the lack of a united front on foreign policy at home. Uh, second is just brain drain. 
And third is resource management. So when I say united front, I'm not talking about a political united front, but rather one that's in the apparatus of the state. In the sense that back in the Cold War, we all knew who the bad guy was. Everybody knew it was the dirty, evil communists. And as such, people had political disagreements and probably disagreements on how things should have been run, but they all agreed at the end of the day, the Soviets gotta go. And as such, a united front of differing ideologies all arose. However, that's just not the case anymore. A survey conducted just last year found that Americans 18 to 34 were only, only 18% of them were patriotic towards the country. And that's kind of a big deal because if you have people in the country working for the country, you kind of want them to have pride in the country they're working for. There doesn't need to be a, the idea of, I don't like this side, I don't like that side. There needs to be, I'm working in the government on a foreign affairs to help whatever the country is doing, regardless of what's going on. And this lack of patriotism can even be seen here in DC. On the 12th of this month, there was supposed to be a massive walkout of workers, uh, I think up on the Hill. And I'm all for people giving their political opinions, but you shouldn't be allowed to be able to just walk out of work because you don't like what's going on. I mean, that's not really a, that, that doesn't really show cohesiveness in the nation. There's also, uh, there also just runs the pattern of some people holding grudges to the government from the previous administration. And as such, possibly you know, clashing with people who are currently in. There's a growing number of young people who wish to no longer see a government that they support, but rather a government that supports their ideology first, rather than them supporting the government first. And as such, it's leading to a issue of, I don't wanna work for this dude because they have differing political views. And the reason I mentioned the young people is, well, because of the brain drain that's going on. The average government employee in 2021's age was 47 years old. Obviously, that can be surmised to be 50 years old now. Thus, a lot of the government's kind of planning for retirement. My parents are in their 50s. They're looking forward to, to retirement. And so key sectors of the government will be lost without experienced leaders who Yes, some of their views and some of their ways of doing things might be antiquated, but you can learn from that and move forward. A lot of the old cold warriors still have something to give to on their level of experience. Lastly is just resource management. The United States beat the Soviet Union by having more resources for more more research, more resources than them. Thus, when the end of history came, it was perceived that the United States just wouldn't run out of resources or you know, wouldn't really be that bad of an issue. The United States currently has 750 bases uh, known across the globe and spends $816 billion uh, just for the 1.2 million people serving, right? Now, more bases, more money, more personnel. It's kind of a hard equation to keep up. The government just failed its, or the DOD just failed its sixth audit last year, and they can't account for 60% of their assets. So resource management's definitely gonna be necessary if we're gonna be engaging on three different fronts at the same time too, arguably up to five. And so managing the, this coupled with changing of the personnel coming in is really vital in my opinion, because you have to keep the country going. But it's always easier to criticize than it is to make solutions, so I have some solutions. The first two issues are actually kind of easy to be fixed to a degree. The first is simply colleges that are putting out anti-American, in my opinion, not, not political views, but just anti-American, you know, this country's bad, et cetera, should lose public funding. That's one way you deal with the fact that a lot of these kids go to colleges. They have professors that say, oh, you know, the country's kind of crap. And they say, oh, you know, I guess you're kind of right. And so that helps on that regard. It would be to cut public funding to colleges that really push strong anti-American views. I mean, people just saw recently college students marching for Hamas, which, you know, probably not the best group to be marching for. And then, realistically, getting on social media and promoting campaigns on why the U.S. is, you know, worth, you know, 
keeping up and keeping going would actually benefit the younger generation because a lot of them don't know a whole lot on how the government works, why it's even a big deal. They kind of grew up in the world of, hey, you know, it's the United States government. It is what it is. You know, I live here. It's great. So getting on platforms like Twitter or Discord and really engaging with younger people that are going into those college realms would really behoove the government. Now, for the people that are already in the government, I think a big way to both promote their ability to work cohesively with people of differing views and to help the older generation is to set up mentorship programs. Essentially say, hey, cool, we know that we have this dude who's really good at what he does, right? He's the head of a department, whatever. You know, he's really good. Now he's in his 50s, maybe, you know, late 50s, about to retire. Well, how would he like to set up a mentorship program with, you know, let's say three, four, five people that work under him to kind of show, hey, this is how we did it back in my day, you know, and allow them to really learn from that experience. That's the one thing I liked about IWP is so many of the professors here, while some of them having older, more Cold Warrior views, they were all really useful in guiding myself and my peers to really kind of come up with better solutions because realistically there's nothing new under the sun. So if there's a solution, if there's something that's happened before, you can probably think of a new way to fix it. S lastly, when it comes to resource management, simply put, the government's just really kind of tightened down on that because the United States needs to the United States needs to find more economically friendly ways in which to conduct their military affairs and their political affairs. In Ukraine, the drone survival rate is 10%, I think, right? So that means 90% of all the drones that go up in Ukraine get shot down. So in case any of you guys were curious, the MQ-9 Reaper drone that everybody likes is a $56 million drone. Now, I'm sure the government can buy a lot of those, but you can't buy a lot of those if every nine out of 10 are getting shot down. When in Ukraine, they're using, getting similar effects with essentially a $100 drone and a grenade. So being able to come up with more, how should I put it, economically friendly ideas on, hey, maybe we don't need to spend $56 million on a drone. Maybe we don't need to do things a certain way would actually behoove them. Another way to resource manage would to basically tell the Europeans very, very forwardly, you guys have to start picking up your military spending and actually start boosting your militaries. Because if we get into a conflict in the Middle East and in Asia and in Europe, it's really, really hard to logistically keep all that going. And so it would, if the Europeans can actually fend for themselves for the most part and the United States not have to baby them, it would actually allow the United States to free up assets to issues in the Middle East and issues in Asia. And so therefore, it just would really behoove the United States to look at its resources and actually maybe get good auditing as well because clearly 60% of equipment not being able to be found is kind of bad. And we've seen how corruption runs with the Russian army and with the Chinese army and how well that has served them when they've gone into conflicts or just general uh, power assessment contests. In conclusion, the world's shifting and everybody feels it. I've yet to meet a person either here or in my home state of South Carolina that isn't like, well, yeah, stuff's kind of going a little nuts. We got to live with the fact that a multipolar world is inevitable. Now, whether or not the United States is going to be able to squeak out on top of the multipolarity is a different story. It doesn't help that things here are embroiled in a contentious election between a senile corpse and a raging orange-haired toddler. And so it kind of really makes it challenging for the United States to lay out a cohesive plan moving forward. However, there's a good Latin saying that I like. It's, if you want peace, you prepare for war. And there's definitely, if not war, a very, very big conflict on the horizon. But I think that the United States can succeed, at least being top of the polls temporarily, through level-headed experience, you know, mentorship programs, pride in one's nation. Because if you don't care about 
how your nation is, then you're not going to care about whether or not the Chinese are doing something in the South China Sea. You're not going to care if Russia takes over half of Europe. It's just not going to be a care for you. And lastly, just the tenacity that kind of made America what it is, you know, the going to go get them attitude is really, I think, something that could help Americans not only create ingenuity, uh, use ingenuity to find cheaper, more effective ways on the battlefield, but also find better ways to try to communicate with the younger generation and generations of people abroad, uh, seeing as that's, you know, the world's moving towards that kind of uh, multipolar area. Questions, comments, concerns? Hang on, I, I think he's got a mic. Uh, thank you. And very great lecture, by the way. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, so on your first solution, just a quick question. While I have to say I do agree that it is very important to make sure that you know American sentiment is always at its highest, especially within our public universities. Um, your solution on defunding public universities based off of any type of anti-American sentiment within a lecture, are there any concerns that that could possibly go against the First Amendment? So, no, not really, because I'm not saying they can't say the things. You can say whatever you want. If you walk out of here and yell at somebody, you can do that, but it's your First Amendment right. Now, if you get hit in the face because you yelled at them, that's a consequence of what you said. Make sense? So, it's not. I'm not saying they can't go and voice opinions. I'm just saying that tax money would not be used to you know, fund them speaking that way. Again, you can say whatever you want, but you live with the consequences of what you say. Make sense? Absolutely. Next. Uh, thank you, Robert. It was a very comprehensive uh, analysis. I have uh, a different take on the future based upon the past. Okay. The three out of the four Polls that you displayed on your, on your uh, yep. The, the three to the left, to make a long story short, have all have all been there, done that. Europe goes back to controlling the world to the Roman Empire. The 20th century was the American century. As recently as when I was born, Japan was fully occupying China. China is the only one who is who has a future that it never experienced. And if you take a look, as I have over the course of the time, Chinese approach toward outer space, Chinese approach toward naval supremacy, Chinese approach toward diplomacy. It is all brand new. They are the inventors of the future. We are mired in the past. And I think the left is ready and going to do to revive its colony. What is America going to do post-1945? Uh, we don't need to go into great detail about America's political culture or past. It is part of it. I believe that the idea of using the criterion of historical momentum, I would bet on China somewhere in the future. Now, it will not necessarily destroy your image of a multipolar world, but it would be a strong contender for some kind of supremacy in the future based upon history. Thank you. No problem. I totally agree. I think China is looking, China along with their allies is looking very easily to break the monopole now and then pick up the pieces maybe in two decades or so because that's how they think. They think well into the future, but you got to break up the current system before you can form a new one. So I totally agree. I think the Chinese definitely coming out of this whole thing, you know, maybe 20, 30 years down the line, definitely have the capabilities to be number one. Next. Um, yeah, thank you for this lecture. I thought you did a good job of just providing a, 
it would be immune for uh, most of the world if we kept it. I was a little concerned with one of your solutions as far as the United States um, just finally convincing Europe to invest in their militaries and defense spending, because I think as we've seen with the Ukraine war and currently the war with Israel and Hamas, even those crisis events have not really spurred the, I guess, the 4% GDP match for NATO solutions, for example. So I think there is a much deeper issue there um, where I don't think the United States can necessarily detach itself from Europe and focus on its own finances <coughs> for any time in the near future without risking that whole theater falling. I, I agree. I think one of the key things is, though, that the Europeans currently are, you're right, kind of very much lagging behind. The Eastern Bloc of nations, Poland, the Czechs, the Slovaks, Estonians, etc., a lot of them are well above what we really expect from smaller countries like that. And that's because they know they're next on the chopping block. Now, there's a whole other concern whether or not NATO is even going to work, which I didn't cover in this. And that's mostly because NATO has never been tested. So it's really more or less a gamble on whether or not, you know, let's say, let's say Russia moves into uh, Latvia, right? Let's say they're saving the Russian population of Latvia. Well, that would trigger, trigger Article 5. Now, I have a very, very strong feeling that the French and the Germans are not super concerned about what happens in Latvia because they weren't super concerned about what happened in Ukraine. They're very much slow on getting things moving to Ukraine right now through aid. And so it seems as though the idea of NATO is still keeping Russia at bay, but whether or not the European countries, and that might be one reason why they don't want to ramp, ramp up their defense sector. That, that could very much be an option, is that the French and the Germans see, well, you know, maybe Russia would be a good trade partner. We did get cheap gas, you know? Because the blocks and poles you're seeing form are not formed from ideology like they were during the Cold War. And during the Cold War, it was the democratic West against the, again, the godless heathen communists. And people al aligned themselves along that line. But now ideology is not necessarily playing as big of a role as it used to. Now nations are looking, well, you know, maybe there'd be a good trade partner. A great example of this, somebody who I didn't put on here, but I, you know, they're an up and coming poll is India. India trades with the, um, trades with the Russians, hates the Chinese, also trades with other nations that we're not friends with, but still tacitly wants to be on our good side. So they're playing really the whole, the whole world as they're boosting up. And so, yeah, back to your point though, when it comes to the Europeans and their military, America just basically needs to tell them, look, if things get bad, and the French have kind of understood this to a degree, I think, because they've noticed the Americans are moving more towards the Pacific theater than they are a European one. I think the Europeans will either go with increased military spending or NATO is dead, one of those two. Next. Thank you very much for the wonderful insights. Um, the main question I have is that where do you see Africa uh, playing a role in all of this shift of global power? And uh, do you believe that especially the modern time, the modern times, Africa has played a significant role with all of this shifting of global power, especially the uh, period of colonialism after this time? And uh, essentially for China too, when I was thinking about it, is that uh, their main economic partner right now is about to Africa. And when you look into their major, uh, for instance, uh, oil supply is in a single country, Angola, which is in Africa compared to uh, many US, uh, is the uh, Middle Eastern country. So where do you see the country of Africa playing a role in all this issue right now? I think that's actually a really good question. I think that what you're essentially going to see is a, honestly another scramble for Africa type scenario but not in the sense of the colonial forms of you know, countries taking over and declaring that part of their colonies. Most likely, and now I'm not an Africa expert, so I'm just gonna leave that out there, but from what I've seen, from what I've read, it seems like right now, Russia and China are really getting a foothold in Africa. Russia, there's several coups that just happened, I think, in the like, Southern Sahara region of Africa, 
And all of those leaders just happened to be conveniently aligned with Russia, mostly because they might have been helped by Wagner mercenaries. As you mentioned, China is known for its resource exploitation in Africa, and I don't see that stopping anytime soon, just because they have the capability to do that. Africa, I think, will play a big resource, just a resource role when it comes to the, uh, when it comes to the future, just because it is resource rich, and because as things have modernized, we need more resources. You know, I need, if I own a Tesla, I have to have chips for the computer, I have to have lithium for the car. I have to have synthetic and other components just to make the car. And a lot of that stuff realistically you know, comes from Africa. So I think moving forward, there's going to be a great power game in Africa on resources and trying to get blocks of countries in Africa just to align with whoever they think's best. Same thing with South America too. I think South America is going to shift into a block of trying to figure out who's going to be best. Because like I said, it's then really ideology. It's kind of coming down to the bottom dollar is, you know, you scratch my back, I scratch your back type scenario. And so that, so yeah, I think Africa, I think the United States should definitely focus in on Africa to a degree and try to convince nations that, hey, maybe Europe, maybe us would be better trade partners than the Chinese coming in, setting up essentially a company and saying, hey, cool, this is ours now. Or the Russians coming in and saying, hey, this warlord happens to support us. Why don't we just follow them? And yeah, I think, I think that would actually be a bit big role, especially because outside of the United States and Russia, China and Europe both rely on um, uh, imports of gas and oil to kind of keep themselves afloat. So yeah, good question. Anybody? Uh, yes, ma'am. So in South America, as far as I understand, um, a lot of the nations there are, well, like Javier Malay is moving more towards a not necessarily anti-China, but not necessarily pro-U.S. stance, right? So he has continued, he's recently just signed a deal, I think, with the um, Chinese about trying to sell some of their yuan into dollars that they have invested in Argentina. And, but at the same time, he's telling the United States, hey, look, you know, we're going to be buddies, we're going to be partners, you know, I don't really like how some of this stuff's going, support Ukraine not over Russia. And I think a very pragmatic approach to foreign policy is basically going to be what you see. I don't, it seems to me like a lot of nations don't really care if you're authoritarian or if you're democratic. It's not really that type of world anymore. Rather, it's who's going to be best for my country. There's been a very strong rise in nationalism, for better or for worse, across the globe. And so countries, as the world starts shifting, is going to be figuring out, hey, who's best for my country? You know, if that means playing nice with the United States because they're you know, just north of us and in our back door, essentially, then yeah. But if I can get a better deal trading something with the Chinese, I'll shoot for that too. It's not a line... It's not aligned by ideology, but pragmatics, essentially. Because of the fact that nations for a very large portion of time were aligned with either the United States or the Soviet Union until the collapse of the Soviet Union, mostly based off of ideological lines. Like we, last time I checked, we didn't, we didn't uh, go to war in Vietnam because we thought Vietnam was a great trade partner. We went to war with Vietnam because we were fighting the continent. We helped the South Koreans because they were fighting the North Koreans who were communists, the domino effect idea. But it's not so much that anymore. Things, you're right, things are slightly pragmatic and have been going that way, but the United States has been number one. So people have had a reason to go and trade with the United States over other nations. Now there's other options. If you give me an option between a, let's say a Mustang, a Lamborghini, and a Ferrari, those are all three really good options. Now I might pick and figure out who's the best, or, you know, I might go with a fourth option. So that's just kind of how things, I think, are moving. Like United States foreign aid? Yeah. yeah, but foreign aid helps whoever the foreign aid ends up with. Foreign aid doesn't, if I'm a dictator in charge of, I don't know, country A, Right, I can get foreign aid from the United States, but then also cut a deal with somebody else. 
I'll go with both those options instead of, you know, having to worry about, oh, you know, the United States might do something. What are they going to do? They're going to be busy over in Europe and they're going to be busy over in the Middle East or in Asia. So it runs along the lines of playing both sides necessarily, not necessarily. I, and don't be wrong, foreign aid's great. It has varying effects of how it's used. Varying degrees of effects, depending on how it's used. I think I saw a hand back here. Yes. Well, if population is declining, you're running out of military staffing, essentially. I mean, one of the key reasons why the United States is struggling with its military capabilities right now is, one, the Genesis system, which I'm well aware of as I've been going through the recruitment process. Second is the fact that, well, you know, Americans don't see the military as a viable economic option outside of really poor states like South Carolina, Alabama, most of the Southeast, where it's seen as a way to go forward. And so... If you have less population than you have, or if you have a declining population but a higher military need, those two don't really balance out. Like China, for example, right? China has a negative population, right? They, they're not producing enough people to even equal out anymore. But they have a lot of men. Now, they have a lot of men that have a lot of nothing to do. Now, if I know in, I don't know, let's say five, ten years, most of those dudes are going to be useless, right? I'm going to use them in the short amount of time that I have militarily to make gains. Because instead of relying on smaller populations to make gains, which is a lot more challenging, uh, they're going to rely on a population surplus to make gains, if that makes sense. So I get what you're saying about resource management and population decline. Uh, I mean, yeah, as places get more industrialized, they, you need less people to do things. You know, you don't need six kids to go work a farm anymore. You need one tractor and maybe two kids. So yeah, I mean, I, I, population decline helps the resources, but if you're talking about global powers, one way you project that is through the ability to have people man the places that you have to go and project. So, like, if I have an aircraft carrier and I only have, I don't know, 600 people, well, that doesn't do anything because there's not enough people to replace those people. So that that's how population kind of plays into it and it also could possibly make countries more desperate or less willing to go to war if i know that i have a lot of people that like let's say the europeans for example right the europeans have population decline let's say they go to war with Europe, with russia right well ukraine currently i think as the figures go the russians have lost about 360,000 men right so those are guys that they'll never get back just you know they're 18 year olds they'll never you know they'll never come back now, if you're a European country and you're looking at mass casualties like that, you're thinking, hmm, there goes a lot of my ability to have industry. There goes a lot of my ability to continue to have resources to begin with. And there goes my ability to have a military that's strong. Because a smaller population means you have less people going to work. You have less people doing jobs. You have less people going to the military. So it does play a role in power projection to a very high degree because, especially in the United States and China's case, you're talking about having to project across the globe. Like, the United States realistically will never be touched in a military war outside of nukes. It's just, it's logistically, feasibly impossible, right? But if we can't control the seas because we don't have enough people on boats, or we can't control the skies because we don't have enough people in planes, well, that allows other nations to kind of fill in that gap. Make, think I answered it? Okay. Any other questions? Oh. Mm -hmm. um, on, regarding China and their population issue, it seems like if they have a negative population, they have the manpower now to make military gains, and now it incentivizes them to take action early. Mm -hmm. Now, from China's perspective, it seems 
that they can see that they are making gains in the U.S. at this time, mm-hmm. which would incentivize them to take the military action later, to wait out the United States for the Taliban. Which do you think is a key center for the human eye when they try to make a gain? So I think it depends on where we're trying to, where, where we think they're going to make their gains, right? So a lot of people are running off the idea that they're going to invade Taiwan. I have an opposing view, I think, and if you want to go back and watch one of my other lectures, I mentioned this, but um, on the IWP YouTube channel. But um, no, uh, I mentioned in one of my lectures that I don't think China's going to invade Taiwan. Because an invasion's really costly and takes a lot of time, and, you know, just, you can't hide an invasion, an amphibious invasion. I mean, the United States struggled doing that in the Second World War. You definitely can't hide it in the modern day with satellites. But China will probably blockade Taiwan. Now, China, I think their goal right now is to, you're correct, they're seeing the United States decline and they're seeing themselves make some gains. But, you know, if they can hedge some gains a little bit quicker now and then just wait longer because they know that, you know, let's say 20 years down the line, the population's in their 50s, you know, 50-year-olds don't really pick up a whole lot of rifles. So if we can make gains now, great, right? If we can... But we can also still wait, right? I don't really think there's a dichotomy between waiting and going. I think there's a we can move now, wait still type thing. Instead of saying, you know, well, they'll wait longer. Well, they might, but you can solidify your hold on areas. Like Russia, Russia's really good at this. Russia will go in and send little green men to nations and claim those nations and then hold those nations and then never let go. Right? This happened with Moldova, with Transnistria. This happened with Ukraine and Crimea and Georgia with Azerbaijan and Abkhazia. Russia still has control of those areas, even though their populations declined from when they initially did it. So if you just take and bite and you know that your enemy you know, might, is going to be on the decline, why not move a little bit now and then wait and then move a little bit more, just gradually? Because the Chinese will think in that long-term thing. And that goes back to the, to, I think this, the second question is, yes, the, or the second question that was asked today, it was that, well, China has the ability to become the sole pole moving forward. Very much correct. In 20 to 30 years, we might be speaking all Mandarin as the trade language. Don't know. But as it goes, you can have that ability to long-term think. The goal of nations now is to break up the sick man of the world, if that makes sense. When the Ottoman Empire fell, it didn't fall instantly overnight and you had all these little nations. It was chipped away. And if you can chip away slowly and slowly, well, then you can get what you want and the other nation will decline. Any other questions? Comments? Concerns? Yeah.